Sports Connection. I'm your host, the one and only Joey Railroads. Uh, before I bring in my special guest today, don't forget to check out our social media stuff, facebook.com slash ASC pods, P-O-D-S, same for Twitter, Instagram, everything's nice and easy to find. All right, our special guest today, he's been everywhere in uh, i would say in this country but everywhere in the world uh, you've seen him is either under a mask or not under a mask and doing all kinds of crazy shit. uh ladies and gentlemen chainsaw tony myers tony how are you doing man better now knowing that we have a solid connection <laughs> that always helps right oh yeah of course it does oh boy um yeah, I'm doing great, man. I got about three and a half weeks to go before I am going straight to Oregon and wrestling in Washington. And there's like two seminars there. And then I go straight. When the Japanese got me the ticket, they got it out of Newark International. So then I got to fly all the way back. Oh, just to that catch sucks. <laughs> and there's a connecting flight because the uh, promoter, Ron Von Hess, when he went to buy the ticket, he had one of his students as part of their paying dues buy the ticket. So it's a connecting flight to Texas. So it's kind of like, uh, I think I'm going to go over to Texas and then pick up the chainsaw guy. And then, you know, we'll head straight to the West Coast. And that'll be the Sayonara America this that, time. Around. That should be an adventure, do, uh, picking that up in Texas. <laughs> yeah, and I, it's so funny. Uh, like, of all people, you know, my parents stepped up and they're like, we'll drop you off at the airport. And I'm like, drop me off the night before because it's uh, like... The flight is at 6 a.m. Oh, God. So I don't want my parents staying up all night long worried because, you know, that's what they do. Yeah, it's a parent thing. Yeah, my parents who are actually great-grandparents because of my uh, middle kid having a kid and making me a grandfather last year. And they still worry the way that they do about me. <laughs> it's just inherent nature. Well, my mother's the same way where, like, if I'm out at shows, you know, doing recording stuff or media or whatever, she's like, you know, text me on when you're on your way home. Make sure, I, you, you know, I, I know you're okay. That's, that's because you have a good mother, and that's what moms do. I yeah. Mean, <clears throat> my father is completely into retirement, 78. My mom's 76. I try to get by the house and see him as often as possible, but you know how much they worry about me, especially when surf – Stuff surfaces online and we get blown up and all kinds of crazy shit, you know. <laughs> Imagine them explaining that to their friends who are like, oh, so-and-so, my kid just got promoted in his job at UPS. So like, ah, oh, my kid's taking a, an exploding barbed wire bat tomorrow night, <laughs> a half pointed away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah, I could only imagine trying to explain that to someone. Yeah, and then when Pogo was wanting to recruit my oldest, who's a volleyball player for Utica, and I was just like, Pogo, she belongs nowhere, anywhere around professional wrestling, but <laughs> yeah, he pursued it for a bit, and then he, he understood the parenting thing that I was like, I don't want her around wrestling. I, I really don't need that. <laughs> I, I can completely understand that, especially, I, I don't want to say it's bad over there, but you know that they they lay them in over there. Yeah, and at first she kind of sort of got into it. She kind of got into pageantry, and then this is my oldest kid uh, who turned 21 like two weeks ago. 
she was like, nah, they're just, yeah, nah, nah. And I, I, you know, that's all the stuff I tried to explain to her. But if I had pushed it on her, she would have just rebunked the whole thing and been like, wow, what is this? Maybe I do need to get into it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you're also talking about my best friend in the whole world, too. So it's like she knows I'm not going to pull any punches. And she knows I'm always going to be there to look out for her. So on top of being her parent. <laughs> Yeah, my my kid's the same way. He want he wants to do it already, and I'm like, let's. I was like, let's wait, because he's only he'll be eleven in January, and I'm like, dude, let's wait until you're at least like fourteen or fifteen, and if you're still serious, then we'll talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's cool though that your kids have a bond with you over something like that. I mean, I got three girls. My divine punishment for being a male <laughs> is. It's the world of difference, you know, it's um, once in a while, my oldest will like screenshot me something from one of the rest where it's like, yeah, this guy's, uh, he's, he's wanting to uh, date me. And, and uh, you know, the first thing I always think about is, is he's trying to like Triple H's way in because I get enough people asking me to get them booked overseas. I'm like, is he going for that? Or I was like, what could this guy possibly have in common with a uh, gorgeous drop dead gorgeous 21 year old girl like you know it, it, it's one of those things and then on top of it it's like i get enough people asking me you know how to get a foot in the door over there if you have started to get a foot in the door over there i could only tell you one way or another what what there is to do or what you could possibly do i mean my house is always an open door for stuff like that you know, if people hit me up with a message and ask me how or tell me how things are going, okay. But if you think you're going to, like, coattail off of me, like, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm your typical sketchy pro wrestler. You know, the first thing that pops through my mind is, like, what, what is this guy's angle? What does he want? Everything's a work. Yeah, like you, you automatically think of the worst of someone. <laughs> yeah, you almost always do. And it's because, like, I don't know, uh... For, for all the backbreaking I've done since I got a foot in the door over there in 94, it's like it, it could all be gone tomorrow if I just screw one thing up. And God forbid I bring somebody in who's going to screw things up. <laughs> it's, it's the world of difference. Like um, Matt Tremont always gave me the world of credit. He's like, you, you, you help me get into And I was like, I didn't help nothing. The FMW office came to me and asked me like, you know of this Matt Tremont, you know CZW, and that was it. His his busting his ass and 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 working as hard as he did. That's what got him there. Nothing that I did myself got him anywhere. No, I I understand. Um, what I wanted to know is what were your like first memories of wrestling growing up? Do you do you remember like uh, how you got into it as a kid? Like who you liked or the funny thing was, like, I would always see, like, friends and neighbors watching it because it seemed like it was on TV all the time or if it was just that early Saturday morning. Um, and we didn't have school, you know, like, kids from the neighborhood would be watching it. Uh, my father uh, is a firefighter. He would take me to, like, firehouse, and I would see people there watching it. So it was like, you know, there was always, like, a registered opinion by everybody. This guy, that guy, the heels, the baby faces. And um, I just kind of grew into it. You know, uh, you would see the Iron Sheik up there and, you know, what heat that guy would get. And then it just kind of morphed into it was like, uh, watch any wrestling that I could. It's just fun. It's, it's a world away from the reality that we live in. And um, I don't know if it really answers the question or not, but it, it's just something that like grew on me. And then, uh, of course, you know, watching Hulk Hogan and WWF go national. Uh, growing up in the Northeast, it was like between that and then going to like area independent shows or the WWF like Sea Town uh, house shows, you know, it was like you got to see all these guys even on the smaller basis. So I didn't, you know, I kind of migrated to just every, whether you were in the opening match or whether you were the main event, I was like, hey, it's a professional wrestler. You yeah. Know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't really gravitate toward that guy's my favorite of that one. <laughs> Yeah, no, and then what you're talking about, I always remember growing up on, you talk about Saturday mornings, it was always back-to-back, -back, it was Wrestling Challenge and Superstars. 
Yeah, and then they had the other show. It was Spotlight that aired like late, later yeah. Saturday. Yeah, and in between that, if you had cable, you know, you had ESPN, you go, wow, AWA is on Sunday, you know. <laughs> All the other places too, especially with the advent of cable TV, that just made you see that there was more out there. That and the newsstands where you would go and you'd go to buy one of Stanley Weston's, like uh, pop, uh, one of his publications, like Inside Wrestling or Pro Wrestling Illustrated. And, you know, you would buy it for the WWF, but then you would start reading about the NWA guys and the AWA guys. Or you would look at past issues and be like, oh, Adrian Adonis came from the AWA, huh? You know, so you were more inclined to, like, check out all of that stuff because you were just – you saw that there was such variety out there. Yeah, I agree. And then I remember, and you probably do more so being in North Jersey when – I can't remember the station, but it was um, one of the New York stations. They would have the show uh, from the garden. Thought, oh, okay, okay. Uh, I thought you were going to say uh, Rich Mancuso and the WFAN yeah, that, network. Yeah, that, that too. Yeah, 6666. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, that radio show was geared toward like smarter fans. So eventually, you know, I eventually found some kayfabe sheets um, and – would ask around about getting into wrestling schools. There was such a plethora of people starting up for every, um, for every like Charlie Fulton, Monster Factory, uh, Larry Sharp. There was Mike Sharp in Brick Township, New Jersey. Bill DeMond had a racquetball court in Lodi, New Jersey. Um, Rocky Jones had ECPW uh, in Lake Hiawatha, Northwest New Jersey. So it was like uh, there, there was so many places and things that you could latch on to and then when you would correspond with other guys that were trading tapes and as big of a fan as you it just seemed like it was such an infinite you know it was like a giant pool of people that you could just meet and talk to and you found out that they had the same love for the same stuff that you did yeah man and it was just i've noticed especially since i started going back to independence in the last few years that it's I've always noticed if you're a fan, it's like you always get welcomed in regardless, you know, what color you are, what, you know, orientation you are. It's just like, you're one of us. Come on in. Let's just have a good time. Yeah, because I think as time went on and more and more people got smartened up to what's going on, you know, it it just ultimately we're thankful that people get off their ass and come. Otherwise, they wait around for it on YouTube or get the download available from something else. I mean... Right about now, like, Naoshi Sano just put this out in Japan, and he was like, it's more and more geared toward, hey, you can watch us on your phone if you don't want to leave the house. So then, like, the live crowd is damaged, but the promotion is still making money because of downloads. There's so many different ways in this day and era, 2018, of, you know, there, there's not the casual fan that's drawn in, in as much anymore, but they're still, they're still housing some really strong, like, revenue for each company and there's so many good smaller companies now there's now more than ever there's so many stronger like smaller companies out there that it's just you know uh whether or not fans show up live they're still supporting what they're supporting i yeah i agree with that that i would say there's an indie boom right now i think so i think like you're watching the bigger ones get kind of downsized more but you're watching like a lot of people supporting local independence. And I mean, I've seen that with a plethora of independence just around this area that people are very diehard in supporting. Oh man, and- you know that just in like Jersey, PA and New York alone, there's tons of promotions. Yeah. When I saw like that, there was a genre of something like beyond wrestling. I go, then there's tons more out there that people could do just like that except for maybe a different concept so that they don't have, they're not watching the same type of product, Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I I just thought it was so interesting to have the boys be the crowd and then watching like beyond wrestling, it just kind of sort of morphed into more uh, casual fans coming out and enjoying the show with everybody else. Like that, that's that's just one example of, but they blew up much bigger than I ever imagined. Yeah, well, I, I think what happened to what you had said where it's like 2018 and being on like YouTube and all the download stuff, I think that's what's really helped them get to where they are. 
Yeah, I mean, otherwise, it, it wasn't strictly the support of just, um, you know, the boys watching the boys and the boys encouraging the boys. I mean, it looked like they started out in the woodshed somewhere out in the Midwest. And now when you see them promoting all these, like, dream matches and everything, you're like, obviously the money's coming from somewhere. Obviously somebody's making some money off of this. And none of those none of those guys are at the point now where they're going to do it for nothing. So there's money being made there. You know, no, how you, I, I matter how you look at it, I, I see them as a really good and big success story as to say, like, you know, who's to say that the next average independent won't come above, won't catch on with just, you know, your, your normal everyday people? No, I agree with that. My whole thing is in this area, and I've talked to Tremont about this at nauseum, where you have to find a way to be different because – there's so many people booking the same match like five, six times over. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think it's, as a fan, wrestling now has got to be better than it ever was. You got the network, this, that, and the other. Like, um, this is like the era for people to be like actual fans of the product because there's so much out there. There's so many, there's so, and there's so many other fans that are just as diehard as they are that are on message boards and commu can communicate much better than we could back in the day when we all became super fans. That's what I was just going to say. I tell these like younger guys if I ride in cars with them and stuff to shows, I'm like, you don't know how lucky you have, and they're like, what do you mean? I was like, you can if you want to see something, any kind of wrestling anywhere in the world, you could probably find it on the internet now. Yeah, and I remember, um, like, I I'd really, I've done, like, several podcasts now, and it's always cool because I, I have so much more to get off my chest. Um, on the one that I did with Shaheen, I had told him, I was like, you know, we kind of sort of live for the moment. We weren't in our phones, or sometimes we were taking notes, but it was like, live for the moment when you went to those old TWA shows. Uh, Todd Gordon out of Philadelphia before it was ECW. Yeah. Like, we, we were watching something special, and there wasn't as much to distract you then. And you're usually there with friends, or if not friends, just people just like you that had a morbid curiosity wanted to come out and check out what it was, you know. And it's like the line of professional wrestler versus fan kind of became blurred in there because everybody was such a super fan that eventually you found out that they were like a manager on a really low rent independent, you know. So. No, I agree with that. And the thing I loved about you mentioned ECW. It was probably. I'll say like 94 when I discovered them. It was when they had um, the Bad Breed with the uh, the Taipei Deathmatch. Yeah, which all the old timers were saying, that's way too much. And even Terry Funk stood there and told them like, you know, uh, you're not really supposed to hit each other with the bat. You know, it's like, <laughs> but I mean, like, like somebody didn't think that Terry Funk was doing too much as NWA champion. Like, I know all the old timers would get down on Flair and Steamboat because they'd be like, those kids are doing way too much. You know, it's, it's, or some old timer probably went up to Bobby Eaton and was like, you know, he's jumping off the top rope, damn it. It's only the third match. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, everything has to come, everything has to move. Everything, you know, you can't just have the same formula over and over and over again. What, what worked in the 80s, there's no reason that it's going to work. In 2018, it just looks so out of place and ridiculous. When you look at it, you're like, wrestling has to move on. In any direction, it has to move on. Like, you know, you see so many old-timers, you know, or, or guys that didn't exactly make it that are around my age, and they'll be on Facebook, and, you know, it, that's that's wrestling just terrible these days. And it's like, man, you sound just like one of those old-timers that we would look and laugh at. The only difference was is, those old timers back in the day had been somewhere and had made a living doing this. Yeah, well, <laughs> you're right in the sense of like wrestling has to evolve because if you don't evolve, then you're going to get passed by. Yeah, and people appreciate your effort anyway. So what's what difference does it make? If if everybody's smart, they they know when you're being lazy, then that just means you have to work hard. Well, what are we doing out there if we're not like? dumping all of our passion and trying to parlay it into what we love. It's like so many times you'll hear people will say, talk about their passion and love for wrestling. But when you mention that, you know, uh, you want to come in a car, you want to, you, you know, you want to see if you get booked on this, you'll see guys just scatter everywhere. Yep. 
oh no, I got to do this, or oh no, I have this or that. If you like, you said, if you really want it so bad, then you're gonna, as they say, do the drives. Yeah, you're gonna, no matter what, regardless, and you won't find any excuses either. Like, I can't begin to tell you how many times I've missed out on weddings and anniversaries and kids' birthday and you know, all that stuff. It's just countless the amount of times. But, you know, I come to realize that nobody ever put a gun to my head and made me do anything. So who am I to complain? Yeah, you, and not you only that, to do it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I realize the sacrifice I make by uprooting and then, you know, and <clears throat> like another month I'll be back in Japan. I realize all the sacrifice there, but too, you got to realize I have my own house over there. I, <laughs> I miss my couch. <laughs> I miss my bed. I miss my old lady. <laughs> you know, I, I, I built for myself another life out there. As much time as I've spent out there, it just, you know, uh, I guess people acted like they were surprised in a way. You know, I wound up with a Japanese girlfriend that I'm marrying. It's that had to happen when in Rome, <laughs> do what the Romans do. Yeah, and I don't see an inherent problem with that. I spent more time last year overseas than I did here, stateside. So it's like I come back here, I get my living arrangement back, uh, you know, I try to settle back into a regular life. I told you off the air, you know, I'm, I'm catering food, you know, but all that comes to an end and I uproot and I change everything, change my lifestyle, change the way I'm eating, hope to God that I keep on any size over there. <laughs> Now, um, uh, what I, I would like to know, and I'm sure a lot of people would, what do you think is the big difference when you're over there than opposed to being back in the States? Well, over there, it's, you know, it's treated more like a sport. There's definitely a higher level of respect for it. And the jokes and things that are done in jest, you know, it's uh, very tongue in cheek. Um, it, it's the, it translates horribly when it comes to like stateside stuff, like even especially with the death match um, in the States, everyone just, you know, violence for the sake of violence. And this is how we get down and over there. It's more of a, you know, uh, this is the only way that we could settle this. Or even if it's, if it's done under the standards of um, the FMW or the old wing banner that people are like in on it, they understand what they're watching and why and what style it is that, that, you know, the promotion versus over here where it's just like, all right, you know, it, it over there, you know, over the amount of time, it became like, uh, kind of like a distasteful freak show. And then with all the other independents popping up because of the original initial success of FMW, it's just a plethora of independence where, you know, you can work six to seven days a week if you want to. But, um, so much gets lost in the translation. Like over there, yeah, you're treated like a gladiator. You're you're treated like a warrior. Over here, it's you know you're you're one step below uh, <laughs> you're one step below a circus clown and one step above a porn star. It's just uh, a perception. Of the yeah, I, I would kind of agree with that. Where because if you mention. Uh, not so much wrestling in general, but like deathmatch stuff. People are like, oh, well, those guys are like circus freaks, you know? Yeah, but I mean, in every, in every genre of wrestling, I mean, how much more ridiculous does it look for guys that, you know, do the straight and, you know, or strong style or not even strong style, but look at the compression of the spine yeah. of just your average match, you know, or you're watching guys take bumps on the ring apron. It's like that in itself is way more taxing than a bunch of flesh wounds from doing death matches. Like oh, there's agree. a compression of there's a compression of the spine or compression of the vertebrae that could do way more damage than someone gigging their forehead while some jackass sticks a light tube in his head. You know, it's like <laughs> Well that reminds me, I, I can't remember the guy's name. In um, New Japan it used to do to shoot headbutts and almost killed himself because he got a uh, hematoma. Yeah, it's it's funny. You look at like New Japan. Uh, Kurosawa is still around. He still wrestles for um, the late Mister Pogo's uh, World Wing Spirit WWS. Yeah. And I still watch him go out there every night and like headbutt the ring post. <laughs> you know, the guy's sixty six years old. Watching him do that, he was one of the very first trainees in the New Japan school. 
And I, you know, I asked him one time, he goes, as long as you don't do it hard enough to rattle around your brain. He's like, because the skull is the thickest part in the human body. And it's like he has, you know, the guy's 66 and still going strong. You know, without the mask, uh, when Pogo and them decided to go with me as a WWS champion, I had to defend the belt against that guy. Here's a guy that trained Bad News Allen, you know, Bad News Brown, Allen Coage. Yeah. Like, man, <laughs> you better be thankful that this is a work. <laughs> I just can't imagine being at that age still headbutting posts. Yeah, and I mean, like, uh, for him, he's like, I've done it for so long that it's just it's just part of what I do. And I mean, he, he you know, without wrestling, he makes pottery. He even invited me over to his place one time, and Pogo goes, he never invites anybody over. He must think an awful lot of you. And I just I just took it as a big sign of honor. I, I just couldn't believe that I was actually there with him. Him, you know, and that I wasn't just, you know, trying to pick his brain with a bunch of questions or whatever. But um, as far as the perception, like stateside prof professional wrestling goes, I always kind of looked at it like this, like, you know, uh, with the death of kayfabe, this, that, and other. I even try to tell, like, younger guys, like, look, you know, uh, kayfabe also exists. Like, don't be dating some girl and tell her what you're really getting to go, you know, 300 miles away. You know, that, that to me just kills the mystique of wrestling because it's probably some rat that you're dating or whatever. So you, you'll be broken up with her anyway. And then she goes around telling everybody, you know, wrestlers don't make shit. And it all ties into the horrible perception by just your average person of just how low rent and bad wrestling is or what it is like to be a professional wrestler stateside struggling, trying to get recognized. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. <laughs> that it's just, know, some things sh should not be known you know you know what i mean yeah i mean i i believe in that aspect of kayfabe should be alive and well you know that that just your average perception of or how you carry yourself or I, I don't think that if you're at a wrestling school and just a normal person catches you on the outside walking down the street that they would come up to you and be like so you're a wrestler huh? i don't think your response should be yeah i'm trying to be and I ain't made much money at this, but one day I hope to make it. It's like, no, uh, let them think what they want as far as the money goes. You know, just don't out and out out yourself as being one of the guys that's not making anything doing it. Then your average person is going to think you're a complete moron for even trying to do it. <laughs> Knowing that you have no insurance or anything else. No, I, I completely agree. Now you talk about training. What what was your uh, training experience like uh, back in the day? That's the funniest thing because 15 years of age, I just went to shows that were so bad and so local and so independent that even without training, uh, with me just reading a bunch of kayfabe sheets, they put me in for a battle royal when I was like 15 years old. Oh my god! I went to shows that were that bad that they would literally use people from the audience. And, but it wasn't until I was 17 years old that I settled down and I realized that I would need training. By then, I had done like a couple shows out in Indiana for my samples. Um, and it, would you believe it, without an ounce of training, it was just stuff that I had tried myself. You know, you're walking past the door in your house and you draw back and you throw a punch at it. And you're like, that's a pretty good working punch. And then you get a video camera, you start filming yourself and you're like, how could this improve? But then, um, yeah, 17 years of age is when I decided to, like, settle down. I was like, I need training. And I would show those guys, like, videos of me wrestling. <laughs> like some of the most god-awful indies. And, you know, they they went to charge me the, the three grand, the 20, I think it was, like, 2,500 up at Rocky Jones Wrestling School, which is still around uh, in its incarnation of ECPW out of uh, Lake Hiawatha, New Jersey. But the minute I went there is when I... Um, like Danny Inferno was just starting. He was like 14 or 15 crowbar. We're the same age and a few other guys. And through them, I found out about, uh, that I could go to build a uh, he rented out a racquetball court that was in Lodi, New Jersey. And then I got there and they were like, Hey, we work out the monster factory. And, and that's, uh, that's in Flemington, New Jersey. And then, um, some of those folks were, 
uh, working at Mike Sharp's wrestling school at a brick township, New Jersey. So it was like anytime I could get to any of those four from that point forward, I was I was there, you know, I was trying to do the best that I could. How how do you think uh, going to those schools kind of helped you become the performer you are now? I think it's like four different um, places. So, you know, you're being told a lot by a lot of people of what to do, and what not to do. But one thing was all universal. Like um, so many of the reversals, so many of the, you know, just very basics, even footing in the ring. All that stuff was universal between all four of those places. So it was like, you know, I got to soak in a wealth of knowledge uh, from this person, that person. And, you know, even back then, the questions that I asked were, were just off based and and just kind of strange for those guys to answer. But, you know, nobody had smart me up before I went into wrestling, you know, of what to do, what to say, etiquette, <laughs> what not to say. So I just kind of did everything the hard way. Kind I was going to say you learned like trial by fire. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I, I learned fast, you know, that what not to do, especially because, you know, so many things that I screwed up. And then um, I, I had always kept the friendship with Jerry Lawler and Eddie Gilbert because Dennis Carloza would bring him in pretty often. But especially Eddie Gilbert, who was just kind of blown away what I knew, because by, by then, you know, uh, I'd be doing all the tape trading. So I'd get his stuff from Continental and I'd get some of the stuff he did down in Puerto Rico and uh, just the old WWF stuff where he was tre teamed up with like uh, Kurt Hennig. And um, it was like Eddie pretty much took a liking to me. And to date myself, you know, I was bringing him like six hour VHS dubs of all the stuff I had on him. So, you know, by the time I went to go down to Memphis, I mean, yeah, I had the, all the general and basic skills because I was taking any booking I could, even bookings where I lost money. But, you know, it was just more about the experience, more about getting a foot in the door and getting to know people and network. No, yeah, I, I can understand that. I, it's funny you mentioned Eddie Gilbert and Memphis. and I was just going to ask you, how did that all come about that you, uh, you – I think you said it was – you were there for 16 years? 17 years, oh, yeah. 17. I lived, yeah, but, you know, during a lot of that stuff, you know, I, I would help them with videos behind the scenes and it wasn't like a solid um, 16, 17 years because I always thought I had to preserve my health for whenever Japan would call back again. But my foot in the door came through Memphis and, and Eddie Gilbert back in like 94. So, but um, yeah, Eddie just knew that I had this unbelievable love for the business. And when Todd Gordon, uh, by the time he had started up uh, the TWA, and he was running out of Philadelphia. They were routinely bringing in Eddie and Doug Gilbert and sometimes Tommy. So it was like, you know, anything I could do to help out, anytime I could referee or even collect ring jackets, you know, just to be around and to establish like a solid friendship. And not only that, I was, you know, the world's biggest mark for Eddie and he knew it, but he never took advantage of it. You know, he just, he just kind of pawned off some knowledge on me and just, just enough for me to know without being smart to everything and even even eddie didn't prepare me for how memphis was going to be <laughs> i can only imagine because i i was watching i think it was last night i i found on youtube there's a match with you and lawler in on uh us wa tv yeah the old memphis territory yeah, yeah in like the little studio <laughs> yeah I'm, people wouldn't believe the name wrestlers that came to that little studio. But, I mean, that was just – that was the format. They taped live on Saturday morning. Saturday night, you were in Nashville. Um, you know, it was, it was just the same formula. They would bicycle that tape around. So you had Monday night, Mid-South Coliseum, and then Tuesday night, Evansville, Indiana, which would be playing a week back from when the tape bicycled over there. And then um, Evansville, Indiana on Wednesdays. Uh, you know, like it, basically you were hitting the same towns every single week on that bicycle, Nashville, Saturday nights, you know, um, and then all the spot shows around the area that they ran. So it took me a while to kind of get used to that, but three years straight out to shoot in the old Memphis territory, it's like you smartened up fast to how things work down there. And, but you know, I hadn't, 
I think either I ignored the advice or I was really cocky at the time when people were telling me what to do when you go into someplace new. And by then, you know, I felt like I had like four or five years experience. So I thought like, who are these guys that never made it anywhere trying to tell me what to do? <laughs> so yeah, Memphis was just a harsh reality when I went down there and, you know, everybody, you know, you could take open shots at the Yankee from Jersey. Who's given a full-time job in the old Memphis territory. It's like, this guy doesn't belong here. He's lucky to be here. He's just a mark that, you know, happens to know how to wrestle a little bit. Now, with you being down there, is that how uh, it parlayed into you doing stuff for WWF back in the back at that time? Yeah, because Bruno, downtown Bruno, Harvey Whippleman, when Buddy Wayne quit doing the ring, they dropped off the responsibility on Bruno, who had a full-time job with the WWF by then, and he still does to this day. So Chief J. Strongbow would go to him and be like, we need a bunch of guys. And I remember one time, just not for nothing, they had chosen this job guy that was really bad. And I go, why on planet Earth is he going to surface on WWF TV? And Bruno goes, they came to me. They told me they needed three black guys, maybe a Latino, and like six or seven like white guys. And then I started to kind of get, I was like, oh, all right. But, um, yeah, Bruno would always have us go up there. You know, I was like, he would, uh, there's, there's one where you see like me, Ken Raper and, um, uh, TD Steele, like carrying Mabel to the ring on his throne after the whole King of the Ring deal. <laughs> it's like stuff like that. Or, uh, when Steve Austin beat us all up at Muggs Bar off of Raleigh LaGrange in Memphis. Oh yeah, I remember that. <laughs> it's like ridiculous stuff like that. Uh, they would kind of joke and call us the run in and bump crew. Uh, there's the one where we came out as security back in 08 when Shawn Michaels super kicked us all on Raw. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, there was there was always something that you there was always like extra kind of work that you could do. And even guys that were being pushed in Memphis were like, yeah, I'll be a job guy. <laughs> Shit. Two hundred fifty dollars and catered food. Why not? And you get your you get your face on national TV. Yeah, and, you know, at least for bragging rights, you could say I work with that guy or this guy or it pays way better than the Indies did. And um, who knows? Um, it's like jumping ahead a bit. Like um, I had done a sunset flip on Diesel, uh, you know, one of the matches on there. And like years later, WCW, they had they had me and another, they had me and Bobby Walker like wrestling against high voltage. And he was like, he could do a sunset flip. And I was like blown away. I was like, how the fuck does Kevin Nash remember that shit? <laughs> he didn't even take the fucking time to. Because I remember, because, you know, it was the first time I ever like picked someone up, kind of slid to the middle of the ring, picked him up by the throat and then gave him a big back bump. I was like, how the fuck does he remember that? Yeah, that, he, that, yeah especially considering all the stuff that went on back then. <laughs> Yeah, for him to take out his time, as big of a star as he was, it was just kind of mind-blowing. But it reminds you that it's a small world after all. Like, uh, I remember the Memphis job guy, Tony Williams, had one hell of a match with Steve Austin. And everybody, I mean, everybody knew that Tony had the kind of, like, talent to pull it off. But, I mean, he, he was always overlooked for his lack of size. But it was just like, eh, it's, you feel kind of good inside for him because you're like, it's one of the Tennessee boys that are just a job guy that's getting ahead and looking good out there. No, yeah. Did, did your back hurt after trying to carry Mabel on that freaking throne? Jesus <laughs> Christ. Well, there was four of us, but, you know, it's like... Uh, I know, but still, my God, that was a huge man. Yeah, I remember there was one time, it was a uh, St. Saint, Saint Valentine's Day Massacre pay-per-view where... They called a bunch of job guys down there, and then they didn't have anything for us. But they had to, like, pay us anyway because they called us down there. And it was like they had the entire thing where, um, I guess, the it was – I think it was, like, pre-show or whatever. It was, like, Mick Foley's brawling with The Rock, and they're like, you guys just make a bunch of noise out, out here. And we're <laughs> like, uh -huh. like, why did we all get dressed up in our gear? <laughs> And they're like, he's, he's going to hit him with a plant. We want you guys to make some noise in the back. We're like, all right. 
It's like, you're going to pay me for this? Okay. It's kind of ridiculous on the surface, but, you know, you take it and you do it. You make the most of it, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, at least you get your face seen, you know. Now, did you, um, when you, you, I know you did stuff for WWF, but you mentioned WCW. Did you do, do more than just that one thing with them with high voltage? That was like a handful of tapings. There was one where, you know, Benoit beat the shit out of me. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> it was like, um, that was a match with Dean Malenko. Uh, just like jobs here and there. It was nothing like, you know, it, it's kind of cool that I could kind of piece together a lot of the stuff that I did. And, and in a highlight reel, it looks pretty neat. But, I mean, at the time, I was more about, hey, a free flight and 250 bucks, like cool with me and actually it was a uh, brick house brown that kept calling kevin sullivan trying to get in there so i mean it just i guess by proxy you know brick house like yeah i'm using my buddy's phone man he'll come on in too and uh there's a really good squash with brick house it's not even a squash it's actually a good match with brick house brown and, and triple h and his brick house brown's wearing my boots <laughs> So I remember, like, right after I wrestled, he's like, man, your boots look nice, man. Let me use them shits, man. <laughs> I'm going to have to look this up and see if it's on YouTube. Oh, uh, which? The the one with Brickhouse and Triple H? Yeah. Yeah. I, I just watched it not that long ago. Because, you know, it's like, man, this has been a horrible recent few weeks. And the last couple months have just been... You know, and so many times people want me to go on record and talk about Brian and what happened and wait till all that surfaces, you know, and 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 all that kind of stuff. Brickhouse Brown, it's like, uh, I don't want to be the guy in misery that keeps dwelling on the, the death of Pogo and, you know, it's it's bad enough living through it. Yeah, you know, no, I, I mean, <laughs> at, the end, at the end of the day, life goes on. So, you know, either you move with it or you're stuck in the past. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I don't want to be that, that whiny guy that's always like, oh, man, Eddie's gone. It's like, you know, you eventually got to work through it. Just own the bitterness, but work through it. No, yeah, that, that's fair. Now, uh, what I wanted to know is how did the whole uh, you getting over in Japan come about? Because it was like 94, right? Yeah, I was when Eddie Gilbert and them needed somebody for wing. Uh, what I didn't know at the time was they needed somebody who was really going to just do the jobs <laughs> because him or Doug weren't going to do the jobs as monsters. And so when I started to get a foot in the door over there, Eddie had his fallen out with wing. So of course, when I arrived, they're like, Eddie's not here anymore. There's nobody like, really, there's nobody there to look out for me. First thing they did was send me to, they were trying to work out a deal with PWC, Pro Wrestling Crusaders, which was owned by George and Kenji Takano. Uh, George Takano was the Cobra in the WWF back in the day. Yeah. One hell of a goddamn wrestler. And so they sent me, like, I thought I was going over there, like, you know, under some kind of push or, hey, even as myself. And, you know, I knew going in, I was like, whatever they throw at you, make the most of it because you're lucky to be over here on another man's dollar. Uh, they sent me there. Those guys had a working agreement with, because Go Ryuma was doing a lot of their main events and so was Goro Surumi and his son and Goro Surumi and his son owned IWI Kokoshia which IWI Kokosai was using basically the same talent on top so with the IWI Kokosai people of course they would bring in Go Ryuma and Go Ryuma was the most famous out of them all and Ryuma on Purisu Baka it's been called Go Gungden uh, it's been called Project X, Project uh, Purisu, Purisu Baka, which translates to Pro Wrestling Idiot or Pro Wrestling Fool. <laughs> all this stuff, you know, and Foley talks about him in his book, too. But all this stuff that, that kind of sort of came to be, uh, I was just willing to accept whatever they would do with me. And so it was like some nights... Um, when they couldn't get the regulars, you know, it was me as the white mommy or me as one of the Uchu Power or Meijin, uh, which is like outer space and valiant monster. Um, me, a guy named Kochiro uh, Kimura, who has passed away from cancer, uh, who, if you ever watched the Choke documentary about the Graysons, uh, 
about the Gracies, uh, he he's one of the guys that goes against Hoist Gracie. So it was like he was a hell of an amateur fighter, uh, really, really schooled in martial arts. And a buddy of mine who eventually I got to really connect through the church with, uh, Ichiro Yaguchi, who, the guy in red and black who teamed with Onita once in a lifetime. Yeah. Yeah, it was like I would, me and him would tag up and be the Uchu Meiji Powers along with uh, Koichiro, uh, Kimura. So it's like between those three promotions, and then you would find work in other independents that were starting up. And it's like Go Ryuma was one of the first guys to like have a famous, famous like independent um, right before FMW. He owned Project Samurai. Um, you know, he was always on the cusp of hanging out on the Indies because he was too old at that point to work in New Japan and All Japan. He just kind of had a, a bad stigma from them. So it was like, you know, there was always like independence. He was starting up. And with Goro Surumi around him and regularly they're running shows with PWC that had its own dojo, uh, the Takano brothers, it was like, you know, they had started up their wrestling in 93. So by the time 94 rolls around, I'm a foreigner with like five years experience, but, you know, they still felt that I was a young boy. I mean, I was only 20 years old anyway, and they were like, you're just going to have to learn Japanese style. And in my mind, I was like, but I want to do the ECW stuff, you know, because you remember ECW was like the big thing. Round 94 was really coming up. Oh, absolutely, because I'm, I'm about – an hour maybe even less from philly so like when i would watch ecw i always felt like that was like our company our promotion you know what i mean oh yeah it's what you gravitate most toward because not only is it local but it's also like you know larger than life i mean these guys were on sports channel and you were watching them take off and you know they had that buzz going for them so which i mean they were actually they were actually just a low rent FMW if you look at it. Like no, they really were. Yeah, because with the influence of Sabu and everything else, you know, you could tell Paul Lee was going for that alternative, which is exactly, exactly what FMW was compared to All Japan and New Japan. Yeah, it was. It was basically the same thing. He was. He was giving his audience, you know, something completely different that you know neither company in this you know, the two big companies in the States at the time weren't doing. Yeah. To get back to like a little bit more detail, it's like with IWA Kokosai, uh, with Sarumi and his son and Pierre Subaka with Go Ryuma and, uh, pro wrestling crusaders, PWC. There's an entire like hour long YouTube thing where it's called cosmic powers for some reason. But Uchu Meijin power, you know, roughly translates to outer space alien power. So uh, with that, um, Onita, because the first couple of shows that he did before the advent of FMW and Pioneer Senshi was the name of Surumi's promotion. It was the name of, you know, this was like one of the first like independents to get really to going against like or the established, you know, all Japan and New Japan. There was always UWFI, but that was more shoot, you know, related. There was IWE, which of course broke off and then became New Japan and All Japan and that kind of thing. But um, the thing was, we were invited because Onita always, he always liked Go Ryuma, you know, even though Ryuma got into a lot of trouble later on in life. Um, he, he always, like, felt a thing for him. So he would always have us come in and be, like, guests on FMW shows. So, I mean, that's pretty much where that connection came from. But I never felt that I was ever going to work my way up to any kind of main event status. You know, I was busy being the white mummy. Or I was busy being one of the Uchu Meijin powers. Or, you know, one of the commandos. Or it, it, just countless things that you could do under a mask. Oh, absolutely. Now... I know you were, you were and are a big uh, Onita fan. What was it like for you personally to be able to come back home to the States with him last year when he hasn't been here in, God, like 20 plus years? Yeah, the whole thing leading up to it was it seemed like every day, 
and you know, I, later on, he had the time for the boys, and he had the time for a guy like me. Back in '94, when we met him, we were just told, "Shake his hand and shake the FMW's roster's hands, and get the hell out of there," because you might say something that screws it up. Just be humble, be quiet. That's what I was told by a translator, and I was like, "Okay." Um, but as years went on, you know, eventually I wrestled for Onita for Onita Pro and uh, Onita's Project X. He came up with his own Project X promotion. And um, when he started doing some of the independents, and then the year 2000, Pogo was using them on a lot of his stuff. So it was like, you know, I'd, I established a friendship with him, but the friendship really didn't kick in until like 2017 was like the big year because I would see him every night and I was working with him every so almost every single night in main events. So it was like, Going into it, I told him, I was like, you know, uh, yeah, I, I already knew who was booked out there. It was uh, Hideki Hosaka and Ichiro uh, Yaguchi was already booked in the six-man. Because, you know, going into it, I knew it was going to be a six-man. Onita hasn't done a singles in years. And Onita said, look, you know, God forbid something happens. And, like, sure enough, a week before, uh, Hosaka breaks his jaw in two different places. And he's scheduled to do double duty. So, you know, I told Onita, I go, well, if I'm on book, man, I don't want to just be hanging around. And he goes, no, you're with us. And he goes, what are you thinking? You know, he's like, come on. He goes, uh, you know, and it was kind of a no-brainer. It was like, you're right, I have to go. And um, he's like, look, you could always bring your merchandise and everything. He goes, you know, people are fans of it. And I go, yeah, I just didn't want to be that awkward guy hanging around. And he was like, you know, you're the one that told me about DJ and you know, I showed him a video uh, in Memphis. I brought in uh, for my own promotion back in '09. I brought in like Sammy Callahan, uh, Joe Gacy, and DJ Hyde, and I was br I was using a lot of the CZW guys, so I became familiar with uh with all those guys. But um, yeah, Onita goes, <clears throat> I arrive in America, and he goes, um, just send something to Tadashi Tanaka to let them know that we're coming to American soil and that our feud is over. That you know, uh, that you're FMW, and you're here with us, and you fought with us, and we fought against each other, and we are FMW. So that was the whole thing around it, and I was like, I'll gladly go in there and represent it because I've given my life for it, and I've damn near died for it. And um, and Anita's like, you can have a great time anyway. I'm, like, I'm gonna have a great time because I'm I'm watching you guys on American soil, and he was like, that's what I want to hear. You know, he goes, he goes, you you can't ever think that you're not with us. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. Um, but I finally got to experience uh, what I had experienced. Uh, I got to see a lot of people experience the same thing of just hanging out with Onita, getting to talk with him, get a picture with him. And, you know, I got a guy like Bull James who I've known since his, like, rookie year. And he was like, I can go back there. I can meet Onita. And I go, come on, he's my boss. Come on. You know? <laughs> <laughs> come with me. Man. It was it was really cool watching him and, like, uh, Ichiro Yaguchi going back and forth. I was like, I never thought I would have seen this moment. Like, it just looks so like a place for them and Pandita to be on American soil, like bullshit with American people. Yeah, um, I'll never. That's one of those moments I'll never forget. Where, because you remember, um, they had the um, where Onita was signing and taking pictures before the show. So I finally get up to it, and he brought the explosion world title with him, which is. The heaviest fucking belt I've ever, ever felt in my life. life. He goes to hand it to me before he went out there. I go, I've already got a flag and chainsaw, man. That thing is fucking heavy. And he goes, well, you were a contender for it. Why don't you just walk out there with it? And I go, I'm going to hang around my neck. And Bandita just sheepishly comes up. He goes, all right, I'll haul it out there. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> I was like, the chainsaw weighs less than that thing does. Like, that thing has to you. weigh at least 50 pounds. And the WEW tag team titles that they made are the exact same material, only it's, like, broken off into, like, three different pieces. So I would, like, laugh at Asagawa. That was, like, one of the light heavyweight champions because, you know, all the belts were made all together. And I would laugh at Asagawa and be like, light heavyweight title? That thing weighs, like, 30 friggin' pounds. You're going to have to haul that with you everywhere, man. And he was like, oh, God, I didn't even think about that. And I go, good. <laughs> Imagine you had a gimmick like mine where you got to haul your fucking chainsaw through a heavy-ass chainsaw through all the, 
train stations yeah. to a bus stop or wait for a guy to come pick you up and and all that, you know. I'll, t- I'll tell you a quick funny story. On top of all the other T-shirts and everything else I haul with me. Yeah, I'll tell you a quick funny story. There's, And he, he put this story on Facebook because we're friends. There's an independent wrestler in the States named Mr. Grimm that uh, his thing is he has like a uh, almost like a money in the bank briefcase. But in the briefcase is like a body bag and he puts people in the body bag. Like after he wins, like The Undertaker used to do years ago. Well, he put up on his Facebook, he recently went to, to Mexico for DTU. And he said he was in customs. And he, of course, he gets the short straw where they want to look through all his stuff. And he said, he opened up and saw the briefcase, opened up the briefcase, saw the body bag, just closed it. And the girl was like, just, just go. Go. <laughs> kind of, yeah, I've heard the name before. The uh, when when I see, we did the entire contrived angle where you know I win the title or I win a title in America, and then I wind up bringing that belt with me, and you know the WWS World Heavyweight Championship and yeah. everything. And it was like I got to Canadian Customs, and once I saw the belts, the guys were, like, taking pictures with it. And I'm like, can I go now? You know, it's like I've been there for, like, 90 minutes. I had Vern Siebert, uh, the old wrestler from Al Tomko's Vancouver promotion. And Vern's, like, waiting and waiting and waiting on me. And I'm like, these guys are taking a bunch of, like, marked pictures with the belt. Like, I got to go. And in the meantime, there's some other guy that's, like, this Indian guy. Uh, yeah, I was working at Customs, and... He's just not amused by all this. And he was like, keep your hands out of your pockets. And I'm like, look, man, I got to go. I've been here for 90 minutes. And you guys are like going through my boots and knee pads. And it's like, there's my working papers right there. Can't you just let me be? That's crazy. Um, I, I got a quick Anita story for you. When he came to America last year, I don't want to name the indie guy just because I don't know if he wants his name put out there, but... He told me this story was one of the funniest things. He had he was working his shoot job that day. So he told DJ, he's like, hey, I'm going to be late. I'm working my shoot job. I won't be there for call time. So DJ's like, yeah, that's fine, whatever. So uh, he shows up, he said, and of course, he said, Onita's outside chain smoking. <laughs> and he yeah. says, I can't remember what he told me he said to him exactly in Japanese, but it translated to something like welcome to America or something like that. He said, so he, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he tells Onita this and he, and he says, Onita looks at him and he points his finger at him and he goes, you, you're late. You're late. And he goes, Oh no. And he's like trying to explain to him that it's, he got the okay to show up late. And he said, Onita just came up to him and put his arm around him and like, it's okay. Yeah, you know, he didn't sleep for like two days going into that. Really? And, yeah, when he got to Hong Kong, nobody in Hong Kong speaks any English and don't speak any Japanese. Oh, God. And, yeah, I had a connecting flight there. Like the very last time I went, I had a connecting flight. And Hong Kong is like the most miserable place. Just to go outside and have a cigarette. You have to, like, get your passport stamped and everything. And both Onita and his old lady. And then um, he had told me, um, because, you know, Hosaka's got so much pride. He didn't want to admit to being in any pain. But it turns out, you know, when the turbulence was kicking in from the airplane, his jaw was broken in two places. Not only that, he was wrestling on his birthday, pulling double duty. And I'm watching this guy do a run from the top rope. And then I'm reading or I'm hearing the criticism of people on the line, like, couldn't they have brought the best of their FMW guys? And I'm like, name one. Because if you think, you know, Matsato Tanaka has got the time to take away from his busy schedule, it's like you got another thing coming. It was a miracle that Onita was able to get away from FMW just for three, four days. That in itself is a small miracle because he's in high demand all over. I mean, we went from one side of Japan to the other with his retirement tour. And it was me and him every single night. So I already knew how tired he was. I never wanted to really bother him. But uh, there's so much more that goes into the story of the once in a lifetime. I mean, standing there watching Matt Tremont outside, like straight out of the hospital and like dry heaving outside. And then, you know, 
I'm being out, I'm outside with Onita, and I'm not going to say who, but there were some people that were on the outs of CCW, and I would catch them out of the corner of my eye, and I'd bring them, and I'd be like, hey, you want me to, you know, here's Onita. And I would tell Onita a little bit about him and stuff, you know. I was like, <clears throat> I know it's a special thing for people to, because he's never here. You know, I mean, uh, I wanted people to feel the same way that I felt around him for the last, you know, 20 years of my life. Yeah. Every time I've been around him, it's a, you know, he has that certain mystique. And like I sent you the pictures and videos and stuff like that that I send you. It's not a way to put myself over. It's a way to say that, hey, this really happened. Here's a picture. I was there. I'm in this picture. Um, I was like, I think I sent you the one where uh, Onita's driving, you know, yeah. just randomly. Yeah. And it's like. You know, I can pick this guy's brain. I can say anything I want to him. And he's so much goddamn fun. You know, you get to a, we got, we would get to all these like stops along the road and everything. And, uh, <laughs> I love this. He always had like the, the world's biggest sense of humor. You'd see Ultraman, you know, the, um, yeah. Yeah. And you put your money, you put your yen into the thing, and the Ultraman guy, he does this, like, striking pose, and it's this giant, like, statue. And there's Onita doing the same pose, and he's like, bah! I'm like, man, how old are you, man? He's like, <laughs> he's like being around a little kid. You know, he just never loses any kind of, you know, so much charisma. We would uh, walk into another, like, you know, truck stop. You know, it's like they have the little places to eat over there. And... <laughs> I'll never forget, like, he picked up one of those giant Chinese walks, and he's like, dong. And then uh, I was like, all right, all right. So I wait for the next stop. I picked up, like, this, they had this, like, bamboo stick there, and I was like, dong. You know, when I go to, because every time he calls the comeback, he's like, dong, dong, dong. You know, he would always say the same thing. So then every time he would walk in there, I'd pick up another object, and I'd go to swing, and I'd be like, dong. And, you know, he would start laughing. And then one night he just goes, always dong. Always dong. Why? And I go, motherfucker, every night. Always, you always dong, dong, dong me. And I started pointing out all the parts of my head that were cut. <laughs> he just started cracking up laughing. That's funny. But, uh, yeah, just a certain, just like a, a, a charisma out of him, you know. Just talk about personality. It's like... Uh, I remember sending the picture back to his girlfriend. I go, look. And it's me in full gimmick with Onita's mom. <laughs> and she's like, oh, he's going to love this, you know, because if there's one thing, man, Onita loves his mom. It kind of harkens back to our, our discussion at the beginning of this. Like, I can't really respect somebody that doesn't love their mom. You know, it's like, it's your mom. You know? Absolutely. <laughs> She would call him sporadically while he's on the road. You know, he bought her a restaurant to run and that kind of thing. I mean, she uh, she still looks out for him. That's her little baby. That's her only kid. Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, he the guy he lost his father at a young age. He was supporting the entire family on his wages from pro wrestling. Holy cow! So, yeah, so everything that he did was pretty much, you know, uh, got to survive, got to take care of mom. You got to respect that. Absolutely. That's awesome. Watching her in no working shape or form, just with her hands together, praying that he's not going to get hurt in his final match. And then um, how it all came to be, I just felt a tap on my shoulder and they're like, oh, you're in the way of the shot. I turned around and his mom was sitting in the chair. I'm like, oh, my God. And then, you know, afterwards, I poured my heart out. I'm like, you have no idea. You know, telling her in Japanese, I'm like, you have no idea how many lives he's touched and just what a great guy he is to me and what a great guy he's been. I was like, uh, you know, and I, cer certain times I would wait for the right opportunity and ask him like, what, what is it that you see in me or why are you so nice to me? And he would tell me guys in America did the same thing for me and Pogo and we were less than nobody there. And I'm like, well, the only reason I'm somebody or anybody is because you two, you know, I was floating around the independent scene over there for six years before Pogo pretty much took me, you know, full, full blooded into his, you know, under, up under his wing. So, I mean, um, it's once Pogo came up with the whole WWS thing that he's like, you always got a home here, like other feds will come and go. And I remember Pogo telling me, he was like, WWS, 
they don't last forever because, you know, I'm not going to last forever. And I knew right then, I was like, bullshit. It, it's always, and to this day, they're still doing, you know, Pogo Memorial shows and Pogo Forever. And he's still on all the posters. So it's like, you know, the bunch of us at WWS realized that this, this guy kept us in work all these years. And we were able to get work from other independents because he was always there, you know, going to bat for us. Anytime Polgo would go to do DDT or he'd go to do another independent, he would bring us with him, a bunch of us, if we weren't working, you know, a regular job, which a lot of the natives over there do, he would always bring us, us all with him. <laughs> it's a lot that we have to be thankful for, all because of him and because of him, like, believing that, yeah, this crew of misfits that aren't signed to any of the big organizations over there, you know. These are my people. They're with me. Yeah, he, he saw something in you guys. Yeah, and I mean, from the very first WWS card where I'm working like twice under a mask, and so is Takase. And then I look at it now, and Takase is the heavyweight. He's been their heavyweight champion for the last two and a half years. It's like, yeah, but that guy earned it. He was there from the very, very first card ever. You know, he was there for so many other... Because... um Pogo had WWS, but he would also do it like in fancy ballrooms with no ring and just on mats. He, he would do like a full wrestling card there. And then he had CPE, which is the same concept, but it's Miss Mongol does all the booking. And she would do the thing where the girls are in cat fights and trying to rip each other's clothes off. Uh, there, there was always, you know, there was always something WWS had those three things going for it. They had their own stuff that they were doing with the ring. And then they had the two, the CPE cat fighting entertainment thing that they did like at least once a month. And then Pogo would run like a WWS house show under the same concept with no ring and like a really nice kind of upscale place. And they would like feed the fans. So the fans would be like watching and drinking alcohol as they were watching like two guys beat the living shit out of each other on gym mats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was like, he was always able to make like those three things work every single month, you know, without a beat. He never missed one of those, you know, and miss, miss Mongo would keep a healthy stock of young girls that, you know, I mean, some of the matches would be like first one to strip nude is the loser. <laughs> so, Oh, wow. Yeah. So it'd just be these crazy, crazy, like small independent shows and, People were paying like thirty or fifty dollars for a seat, you know, just to watch this. And you would see all the wrestlers get together and like, you know, put all the food in different plates and everything, you know, and put out like programs that came with your the uh, purchase of a ticket to like WWS shows, you know, it was like a way to build up toward the big show that he was doing with WWS, which I mean they had like four big shows each year, including their anniversary show. And they still follow the concept of those four big shows. They fill it up like this year we're in Shimabashi, which is like dead heart of Tokyo. And even Pogo's uh, ex-girlfriend, uh, mother of his kids, would tell him, you should run in Tokyo. But he always loved running in the Guma Perfecture, which is like two different perfectures away from Tokyo because he grew up there. And it was easy for him to sell tickets to. Anytime he wanted to put up a ring and do two, 3,000 people with Onita on top, he did that until literally until the day he died. Wow. Yeah, it's like I established such a loyalty to it because, I mean, I look at the name wrestlers from Japan that I got to wrestle in like six mans or tags or even singles. And then he puts me at the helm of his ship and makes me his heavyweight champion. It was like, I have a brand new level of loyalty to this product. I mean, he let me go out there. No mask, no nothing, just as Tony Myers, his heavyweight champion. So, you know, just really got fortunate, really got lucky that somebody took that much of a liking to me, that thought that much of me, to put me at the helm of their ship and say, this is our champion. That's awesome, man. Now, um, what I wanted to get into is how you uh, got basically got passed down into the Leatherface thing and then became Chainsaw. Tony Myers. I love the whole entire, and I love the entire storyline with Onita. And it added 
going from uh, Leatherface to Chainsaw Tony, it just added another layer. So I was able to do yet another tour with Onita on top and him saying, I'm going to rip that mask off and show everybody, you are who I say you are. And he was like, I have wrestled you countless times in Pogo's WWS. You're not fooling anybody. You're the only person here with that hair. You're the only person here with the contacts, the, the bright blue eyes. It's you and me doing the old Memphis territory gimmick of if it's me, I'll leave this country if you can unmask me and pull the mask off. But it's not me. You know, and then adding that added like a brand new dimension to because we had to do something because all last tour, that's all he did was beat me every night in main events. So we had to add another layer to it. But um, rewind back to 2003. That's uh, that was the debut of and Pogo wanted to go a different direction and call it Sin Leather. But then, you know, fans were just, oh, laser face, you know, <laughs> It was difficult getting Kirshner because Kirshner was uh, the original Weatherface, was settling down in a job where he was like truck driving. First, he was bouncing out in Florida, then truck driving, and then he started like family life. So it was kind of difficult for them to bring him in, and then they would have to find him enough work to warrant, you know, paying, what, two or three grand for a plane ticket. So then, you know, Mike Patterson, second one, they decided, hey, you know, he's got a Japanese wife. She's probably going to want it. And they went that angle. They went that route of telling him, hey, come back to Japan. And then eventually, you know, he was starting up a farm with his brother outside of, oh, yeah, Winnipeg, which is like a 24-hour drive from Vancouver. So they couldn't fly him out of anywhere. And they just found it more and more increasingly difficult because he was starting up his own business. So Pogo's like, you know, he goes – uh, you're only maybe an inch or two shorter than Kirshner. And he's like, maybe three, four inches Patterson's got on you. He's like, but you guys are built the exact same. He was like, just keep working on your upper body. And he goes, because you know, hauling around that chainsaw is going to be a bitch. And I don't think anybody realizes until they've actually swung one over their head and done the whole dance with it, how fast it'll blow you up. So 2003, 2001, uh, Pogo wrestles Leather and the second one, and they wound up selling out like Kumagaya. And they were going to go to Kagahara with the same thing, but they sold out the whole bottom half of uh, Kumagaya, and that was like 3,500 people. For a tiny little independent, Pogo's like, we got to keep the fire burning. Well, what happened was then he started having all the difficulties of bringing back another Leather. So there I was dwelling around there, and he was like, Let's get you booked in Mexico. When you're there, pick up a mask. This way you know you have it. This way you know you're comfortable wrestling in it. He's like, somebody from here can make you up one. He was like, but you got to go away for a little bit. I mean, everybody's seen you nonstop at this point. 2001 with all the WWS shows and, and stuff we were doing. So, you know, I uh, went out to the hardware store and Pogo was like, it's a hell of an investment, man. He goes, the chainsaw that I want to give you is like 450 bucks. So, he's, you know, and I told him, I was like, well, I'll, I'm paying for the apron and I'm going to shit up my pants and a brand new dress shirt and a suit jacket. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> and then from there, I just did nothing but study their mannerisms and everything else. So it was like my ultimate goal is to combine the two of them. If I could combine the charisma of Kirshner uh, along with Rick Patterson's move set where he's doing all the moonsaults and everything else, I was like long as I could do that and just have that level of charisma where uh, I'm just not going out there like a zombie where I'm going into it and I'm, you know, really into the gimmick and everything. And uh, down to the facial expressions, down to interacting with referees, the guy you're wrestling, playing to the camera and to the people. It's exhausting. But, you know, it's your <clears throat> ultimate, if you think you're passionate, you're going to do it anyway. So, you know, the idea... Eventually, you know, he came to me after about a year and a half. He went back and forth on it because he was trying like hell to get the other two to come in. And uh, eventually he just put it on me. And whenever the other one, when uh, the original Weatherface would surface or even the second one, Rick Patterson, he was like, that's the gimmick that they're best known for. And I'd be like, hey, I'll be on the undercard, man. It doesn't bother me. But eventually it just morphed into full time me in WWS is sin leather. And, um, that was Pogo's way of separating the two. 
because he's like, they've already seen the first two. And then it was Onita combined with Pogo that came up with the idea of like a trilogy. Like you'll be the final Leatherface. Like after you, uh, the gimmick is dead. <laughs> he's like, what What are we going to do? And keep introducing new Leatherface. <laughs> like the original is, you know, 61. That speaks for itself. And then, you know, the second one, as busy as he stays out on this farm that he has, uh, with his brother that he owns. It's like this gorgeous ranch. You would have to see this thing to believe it. But uh, combined with that and the fact that he's like, what, 58, 59 now, and he's winding things down as well. So they just felt that if they had their own that was there in Japan and, you know, that slowly people would people would not buy into it, but people would eventually accept that that's me. His whole idea behind making Tony Myers a champion was he doesn't need a gimmick. Like, this guy has put in enough work by himself, you know. And that was to say, too, hey, you get your face seen with a heavyweight title. It's like, no, you didn't need a gimmick to get this. This is your ultimate reward for how loyal you've been to the company all these years. That That's that's cool, man. Now, it's funny, you, you had posted this question on my... My Facebook page, that, and I, I figured I should ask it since you did a lot of this as the Leatherface. How are you not dead? <laughs> this passion over common sense. Because I watched that video that you put up. Um, you can, if people want to check it out, you can find it on Tony's uh, YouTube. Um, some of those exploding bat shots were like really like difficult to watch disturbing <laughs> it's like well you know um you think about all the other crazy horse crap that i've been through and i mean that i mean yeah it got to the point where it's like one of the buttons from my shirt this is like really graphic uh the plastic button on my shirt had gotten so hot from the explosion that it just like kind of fused to the skin on my stomach that yeah and it was bad enough that onita went to cover me <laughs> and onita was like, Ugh! and then he took a he kind of like rock back for a second then you see him just like cover me with his two hands and he was going ah <laughs> <laughs> he's grabbing his stomach he was like shit's burning me man uh, well, burning you <laughs> yeah well you know it's bad if he's doing that i thought one of the funniest things it got to the point where it was like night after night after night of me and him wrestling in main events so i started being like a wise as every time he would pin me i'd go wow thing <laughs> And then the next night I go, wow, thing, you keep retiring. You know, he would, I was trying to get him to laugh, you know, and he, you could hear him laughing, but he wasn't like, you know, his face wasn't showing it. That's funny. You'd hear him belly laugh and him just like, oh, yeah, 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 enough of that shit. <laughs> I told or, you, know, I think I've I told started, you. I started yelling at him in English and it was so funny because, you know, he, he knew that he needed to brush up on his English. So night after night that we'd either hang out or we'd just like wrestle each other and he would be working on his English. I would just say stuff to screw with him in the ring. You know, I was like, well, one time I'm like picking him up for a slam and I was like, my neighbor's dog has a 12 inch quit. And he goes, what the fuck are you talking about, man? Like in the middle of me picking him up and slamming him, you know, it's like, I was like, if I could make him laugh, you know, at least I could get a laugh out of him. Oh, dude, he has, like, the funniest laugh ever. He re It reminds me of a James Bond villain. There was, you'd have to ask Tremont about this. We were leaving, at, like, I pointed out to Tremont, because uh, Onita was, like, incognito wearing glasses, but you could just see by the looks on people's faces, they were, like, their eyes lit up. And they were like, oh, my God. This is all of us walking through the Pachinko Hall. And I pointed out to Tremont. And then later on, we were leaving. We're walking, um, walking out to where, uh, down into like by the train station. Yeah. We were leaving, we were leaving out of the buffet to go to the Pachinko place. And, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. It was afterwards. Uh, we went to go back to like this really exquisite hotel that you got a reservation for and everything. Uh, ate this really nice buffet. And I point out to Tremont and I said out loud, I go, look at how the people are looking at him. And Onita latches onto it and he goes, yeah? And I go, come on. I go, I'm pointing it out to him so he can see it. And then Onita's like, he just starts going, I'm famous. 
I'm famous. <laughs> More people are looking at him like he's crazy. <laughs> but uh, no, nah, it's stuff like that. Like uh, countless times, we would be out on the road, long drive, and you would just see people sheepishly come up to him, like, "If you could please sign this." And oh my God, if I could take a picture of you, and, you know, here's a guy getting interrupted from his hot meal, and he would just smile and be like, "All right," you know, and it was like. Then he would hearken back to, he was like, you know, when I was 15 years old and I was breaking in, I always wished it would be a day like this. And I'm like, yeah, but you get this all the time. And he goes, yeah. And not a day goes by, I'm not thankful for it. And That's then, awesome. uh, it's, it's funny you mentioned that. I have in my, my bedroom, the, you remember the real big posters they were selling at Once in a Lifetime? Uh, it's the one that he's like wrapped up in barbed wire. Yeah, where he's like halfway hunched over. He's got one hand that's like way down below his waist and the other one kind of cocked up. Yeah, yeah. I have that framed <laughs> yeah. in my bedroom. He signed it and Tremont signed it and it's framed in my bedroom. That's what I wanted to tell people about like something with once in a lifetime, like as much criticism and scrutiny as it came under. I was like, if you went out there, and you didn't have a good time. I knew people that got posters and stuff of theirs signed because other people brought it there with it. You know, it's like if anybody could get the same kind of feeling that I did the first time I was around him or the first time that I wrestled him. And it seemed like everybody that came there that night got that experience. And like, come on, let's be honest, man. You know, it's like uh, as much money as I've gotten so lucky to earn or anything like that enough to you know, put my kids through college and buy a house overseas. And as fortunate as I've been in this lifetime, you know, I, I, I got there because I'm just a lucky super fan myself. So, I mean, this was the day for us all to tell me, yeah, I'm a fucking mark for you, dude. Like, come on. Night after night after night, I went to wrestle the guy. And every time I heard wild thing hit, like goosebumps would raise up on my arm. That's night after night. It's funny you mention that. I, I was going to say, you know, like, as wrestling fans, some of us are, like, jaded from seeing, like, everything that we have. But I got to tell you, that night when his music hit and Matt's music hit, I had, like, goosebumps. Yeah. To show you how loud it was or just how vocal and into it people were, I couldn't – I had the chainsaw running. I couldn't hear my own chainsaw. Oh, wow. That, you something you can hear like there was uh there's a video of rob feinstein following us like on the way out as me yaguchi pandita um onita and osaka are headed out there and like you know i it's funny you see me at the curtain and i'm like i told osaka i'm like you go first dude and he was like oh come on i go no no you're you're you and um i mean i'm revving up the chainsaw you can't even hear it. i mean you can hear it but you can't hear it that loud that's how loud it was in that place. That's like ridiculous off the charts. And then coming out and hearing people chant FMW and hearing people chant Onita, it's like, good. Now you guys get to experience what I do every night of my life when I'm in the ring against this guy. And I remember like one of the guys ringside, they're like, I go, I'm going to get out of your way. I told the guy in the front row, I go, I'm going to get out of your way. And the guy's like, oh man, shit, leather balls. Hey man. <laughs> And uh, I, I remember glancing at the guy. I go, oh, I'm just thankful it's not me taking an ass whooping in there this night from him. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I don't know and, if you've ever and, seen uh, two, no two nights later, we go for a, a house show for Zero One. And, and I turn on Onita after the match. Like, And it was so funny because one of the journalists pointed out, they're like, nobody has ever, ever, ever interrupted him during what they call Onita Theater, his post-match interview. He goes, nobody's ever attacked him and cut him off during that. And I'm like, you know, and then in the post match or in the post, uh, the post thing, you know, after I was done teaming up with him and Yaguchi and Osaka, you know, I pointed out, I was like, you seem to forget, man, I'm American after all. I was like, and not only that, I go, biggest match in history of FMW of, you know, we're family, we're together. And you got me sitting on the sidelines with Pandita waving a fucking flag. I was like, I took it as a slap in the face. And it was so funny because like, Osaka sheepishly comes to me and he goes, 
you don't really feel that way, do you? And I was like, what you, <laughs> I believe that shit. I was like, what do you go, Mark? You believe that shit? There's a uh, like um, during us wrestling, it was like uh, Utsunomia was the name of the place that wrestled uh, in a tag match against Onita with uh, Hosaka taking the Mister Pogo two name that Pogo had given him when he was in his Pogo Army days. Going against him and Naoshi Sano, which is to this day like one of my all time favorite, favorite, favorite matches. And um, I thought the funniest thing was right during it, you know, like he would get so excited, he'd just start pulling me by the hair, and I'd be like, oh, get off my hair, you know, like I'd be pissed off because it's my real hair. And he'd be like, oh shit, I forgot. <laughs> so he'd start pulling me by the side of the mask. And, um, I remember making a comeback on him and I'm like drilling him and drilling him. I was like, I fucking had enough of you. And I start choking him. And in perfect English, he goes, I've had enough of you too. And he swats away my hand and just starts giving me forearms to the face. <laughs> and I remember it was like at, at one point in time, I was like, I should ask him, like, dude, you don't really think I've had enough of you, man. I can't get enough. <laughs> That's great. I don't, but know, yeah. I don't know if you saw this. Um, there was, and it, I still watch it to this day. Uh, there was a hype video that CZW made for, it, they put it out probably about a week or two before Once in a Lifetime. And Is it the, the Dream On one with Tremont? No, it's um, it's a different one. I think the artist's name is, Ke is Kesha, and it's the song Praying. Hmm. I'll have to send it to you. I would, I would have to see that. Yeah, it's it's really really well done. I know that the Dream On one with Dream On, yes. you see him in the store, and then you see him with his arm in a sling, and he's flipping through the DVDs. I got goosebumps, and then it was like to show you how special like Once in a Lifetime was. Like I got goosebumps watching. I was like, I love this video because I had seen it before then, and then the opening chords of Onita's music. I'm like, holy shit, and. Like I said, there's the video of us going out there and Feinstein shooting it with his own, like, um, with his phone. And you hear Feinstein, as soon as he heard the wild thing coming up, you hear him go, here we go. <laughs> he already felt what we were all feeling like, holy shit, we finally get to do this in America. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you noticed this. Um, shit. I, I'm trying to remember his name. He He's a really famous podcaster. Was there, like, right along the aisle? And he's a huge Onita fan. I'm trying to remember his name. He's on WWE's, uh, on their pay-per-views talking. Oh, shit. Sam Roberts. Sam Roberts. The guy with the fro. I call him Sideshow Bob. Yeah, you know, um, it blew that guy's mind. And I remember, like, uh, seeing Joey Janela back there and going, hey, man, <laughs> this ain't Banditos, man. I guess we've come a long way. And he goes, this is what they got you doing tonight? And I go, Nick, I've been leather since 03, man. <laughs> this, this is not just tonight. Like, we've had an entire war over there. And I was like, man, I was like, you're, you're doing good enough these days. I ain't going to bore you with any of the shit that we've been doing. He was like... No, man. He's like, this is it. He's like, look at all those people out there. I'm like, this is incredible. Like, it, it, people say what they want about the criticism. And it was like, they didn't even, they failed to realize that in the post match, Tremont got his ultimate goal. He got his tour of Japan. Yeah. He got the main event in Japan against Onita. That was like that kid's ultimate goal. And he got his jacket. So, yeah. And it's like, doesn't anybody feel good for, like, this is all about Tremont. You know, it's like as big of a fan as you want to think you are of his, the only reason that he or anybody else for that matter is really doing death matches because Onita is the one that invented all this shit to begin with. You know, it's like, how could you have such criticism? Ah, yeah, it was turned into a six man. It was like, there's 10 million reasons why, you know, it, it's, do we overanalyze that? Or I just look at it and go, Hey, I think everybody had a great time. I was going to say, just be happy for what it is or what it was, you know? Yeah, when you got at the end of the show, Onita beating or welcoming Tremont into the FMW family saying, you're now one of us. You know, you want this? You want this this bad? Are you going to give it everything you got? You're going to pledge company loyalty? Well, here we go. 
it's me versus you overseas. Like to me, that was just a moment that captured everything. Like Tremont ultimately got his goal. He got to wrestle Onita. I thought one of the funnier things too was uh, just point out like doing all the night after night things with, with um, Nozawa. Nozawa, <laughs> Nozawa one night kind of looks around and he goes, Odaiba, you know, we did like three or 4,000 people there. And he goes, man, look at, look at those people. A lot of good crowd. Nozawa just goes, well, man, I'm nervous. <laughs> like this is Nozawa. He's wrestled Onita 10 million times. Like, and I go, yeah, me too. I always am. Like, no matter what, every single night that we wrestled him, and it's been hundreds of times for both me and Nozawa, especially Nozawa, because uh, he was he was wrestling Anita all the way through when I left, and even when I came back, he was still he was still my partner too. And I'm like, if you ever get tired of wrestling each other, I would just joke, and he would be like, oh man, I'm feeling nervous for some reason tonight. I don't know why. I go, yeah, me too. Like, it's one of those things to say, like, no matter how many matches we have with this guy, it's still Onita. Yeah. <laughs> well, this, it's funny you mention that. I had a guy, um, a fellow podcaster, because I interviewed uh, Abyss and Rosemary and Crazy Steve this past weekend, which was a really cool deal. And he goes, do you ever get nervous? And I said, listen. I was like, I'm always nervous. I said, or I'm excited or whatever. I said, when you stop feeling that, something's wrong. <laughs> yeah. It's just um, too many times I'll be like ready to go out. And it's always like it's the best, yet it's the worst feeling. Because you're like, man, I feel like I'm going to have a heart attack. I'm getting so – like every time before I would go out there, like <clears throat> I remember uh, Mama Sasaki, Mr. Ganesuke, and – that Sato Tanaka were all just standing there watching me drink like drink like three it's like three quarters of a liter of coffee. It's just a ritual before I would go out because you gotta be so fidgety. Yeah, you gotta be so fidgy. So they watched me like nurse and drink on water and then they would just see me like pound away at this thing of coffee. And Tanaka's like, How do you not get blown up drinking all that? Like he's like, Don't you know, man, it makes you dehydrate? And I'm like, I don't know. I've just grown so tolerant to it, you know? And um, not only that, that first five minutes going out there chasing people everywhere, like you got to have some level of commitment to the gimmick. You also have to have like some level of energy. I mean, I'm, I'm a 45 year old grand, I'm a 44 year old grandfather. Like, uh, you know, you, you just, it has to come from somewhere and it just can't come naturally. So coffee is that extra kick that kind of drives me through. But, um, and then not only that, it's like, after the whole ring entrance and everything, um, I explain. I explained to you off the podcast that like <clears throat> sometimes it will be like you know either they want you to fuck with the people heavy, like go through all the seats, or they're like just come to the ring. Either which way, you're putting everything you have into it. Because if I'm coming down the ring, I'm going to spin in a bunch of circles, do the leather dance, you know, and not mess with any people. But still, I'm putting everything I have into it with that chainsaw. I was going to say, and people don't realize how physically taxing that is. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, the energy itself has to come from somewhere. You know, the extra kick of energy that it's going to take. You know, I, can, I make it a routine thing to nurse on coffee all day long. But wrestling-wise, I'll drink that first quarter of coffee on my way to the building. And because they sell it in, like, the liter bottles. And it only comes out to, like, 70 yen a piece, which is, like, Less than a dollar here. Holy cow. Yeah. So, I mean, I always load up on those things. And it, it's just, to me, it's just that extra kick. You know, it, it's, there's no way it's going to come naturally. Not only that, a match on top of it where everything has to be fidgety. Everything has to be 100 miles an hour. It's Japan. There's no looking back. So many times in there, I'll, I'll remind myself, I'm like, you're in Japan. You better step it the hell up. Like, yeah, and like there's so much in between that goes on. It's like even in death matches, there's a lot of elbow drops, knee drops, knee lifts, shining wizards, suplexes, arm drags, hip tosses. That's not just death match stuff where I'm just stabbing somebody with something. You know, I'm wrestling Louie and I'm doing the suplex with the roll through and still doing the moonsault and all that other stuff. The DDT, which was like the homage to Onita. 
and, and all the other stuff. It's not just me stabbing people with blunt instruments. Like to me, it it, it should always kind of come up to that. You know, it's like uh, with Louie, it was like uh, going into the whole thing. I go, it's going to be so horrible if I have a bad match with this guy because everyone's going to be like, oh, what the hell is a bum like that doing, you know, tour in Japan? You know, it, it just felt like all this bizarre pressure was on me. But I think I put that on myself because I was like, you got to give people their money's worth regardless, no matter what. Well, yeah, and, and because, you know, not a lot of those people potentially had ever seen you wrestle, let alone wrestle live. Yeah, exactly. Or they've seen a different incarnation of me like if i wrestled as tony myers you know this this guy that dwelled in nightclubs all tripped out on only god knows what <laughs> it's like <laughs> or, or any incarnation i always took with the gimmick you know any which way i went with it it was like uh, i i know the local people it doesn't mean a whole lot that oh it's tony myers going out there but um you know to me you know with the leather face thing and the mask and everything um i you know, actually, afterwards, I migrated more toward the Chainsaw Tony thing because I thought, you know, that'll separate me from Leatherface. And, and people can see it's my real hair. It's uh, The mask itself is like an homage to Hayabusa because it's a Hayabusa mask. But it's just, you know, it's done with Leatherface. It's the exact same thing, with the style and everything. So it was like, um, you know, going into it, it was like, how am I going to be different from the other two? You know, and it's like you... You have to be a 2018 version of it, which explains, you know, the highlights and the real long hair and all that crazy stuff. But I didn't want to be just like a clone of either of the first two. I'll do the mannerism stuff like that. But uh, to me, it was like, you have to make it different or you have to make it unique. You can't you can't just copy someone else's everything. Yeah, well, like how you do the the chainsaw Tony thing, like where you kind of mix it up. It's almost like it's half you, half Leatherface, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. And then even in the promo thing, where the guy's speaking in half Japanese, it's like, well, I thought about it realistically as big and stupid, and basically the guy's retarded. <laughs> it's like, well, as for all of his faults and everything, there is a bit of like smart in them you know there is a bit of of, of uh of the guy being kind of wise otherwise how would he know you know what door to get out in the building or or where to dress or how to dress himself or how to lace his shoes you know there's there's a justified way of why this guy is a monster and why he thinks he's right in being a monster yeah no that that totally makes sense where you can't just have him be a complete idiot yeah i mean i never I never looked at, like, crazy gimmicks or monster gimmicks. I never looked at it like, you know, how does – or how would this guy know where to pick up a check or to cash a check from the promotion if he's so crazy or or whatever? And then it's like for all the people that see you leaving the arena, they see you just toting your bag and you're just kind of like a normal guy with a mask on. It's like, well, there's got to be an added dimension to it. There has to be – there has to be some whys – you can't believe that this guy has been in Japan for, you know, what, 15 years alone with the gimmick itself. You can't believe that this guy hasn't learned any Japanese. Like, that's not that's not even plausible. So that's why you see him every now and then. He'll kick out a gimmick and just start yelling and cursing in Japanese because it's all stuff that he's overheard or all stuff that's Yeah, I was going to say, even, like, if you didn't – know the language if you've been there that long you're going to pick up on something here and there yeah and i always thought the american version of it is fun because this guy has been in japan so long you have to know that he's picked up on a lot of uh japanese and i mean that's that's what i wanted to do with louis and everything else was you know it's just kind of going through some japanese customs uh, you know i i pointed it out like um even through Facebook, I, I pointed out that legit, you know, going against Louie in a singles match, uh, there was at least two times where I counted myself like getting choked up about something. And one of them was, you know, the place broke out into an FMW chant. And I just thought, man, they know what everything has meant to me. You know, like they know that you know, anything that the promotion ever needed in the latest, you know, incarnation of FMW. Uh and it, it was the place that I always wanted to be. And, 
you know, being as big of an Onita fan as I was and a Pogo fan and everything else, like, you know, uh, they just knew how much FMW has meant to me and just how much of my life uh, stateside I've missed out on by being over there and doing what I can for those guys. But also, too, um, on, on top of the sacrifice, uh, I look over there and I see Louie decked out as Mr. Pogo, you know, and it's like, God, would Pogo have loved this? Now, I I know that I've told uh, the story elsewhere where it was like Pogo's ultimate goal for WWS was to run like an all guy jean tournament. And Louie was one of the guys that he hand selected, you know, like it, it would have been Louie on an airplane to compete for Mr. Pogo's WWS in a one night tournament. Like how incredible is that? Like the death of Pogo took its toll on people in so many different ways. You know, you, you could just imagine, you know, an eight-man tournament with guys like Eddie Kingston, uh, Pogo was high on Ego Fantastico, Matt Tremont. You know, these were all people, Chris Kewing, um, who wrestled pro champion. Uh, it was guys like that that, you know, Pogo took a liking to just by proxy, by, hey, who is this guy? Who is that guy? Uh, with Chris Kewing, who's, you know, one of my better friends out outside and inside of wrestling uh with him it was different pogo heard me listening to the doors people are strange and he came in the room and he was like what are you doing what is that he goes i love that song and i go watch this and it was cueing morphing into his uh i don't know if you've ever seen his gimmick or not but it is so creatively awesome it's worth mentioning i'm trying to remember off the top of my head i don't think i've seen it the entire uh, surface behind the gimmick is he was given so many. And, you know, I was there when he was breaking in as a rookie. He was given so many outlandish and stupid gimmicks. Just, you know, hey, you're the Japanese assassin tonight. Hey, tonight you're the Boston Strangler. He was given all these gimmicks that were so goofy and just such bombs that he eventually just went nuts. And then under his legal name, you know, he wound up lashing out at everybody and saying, this is who I am. And fuck all these stupid gimmicks i'll fucking kill somebody you know because legit the guy's six four and like 245 250 like a thick 245 and you know basics wise the guy was on point with everything you know he's in one hell of a talent but um yeah it was like i always looked at that gimmick and i go that that kind of sums up the whole chainsaw tony thing is that you know i had been given so many chances and so many gimmicks that, you know, eventually one day I was just like, I'll be this gimmick under here, but here's the reason why I'm pissed off, bitter, angry. Here's the reason why I want to draw blood. <laughs> well, that sounds really cool. I'm going to have to check that out. Yeah, the video and the editing that was done by Eddie from the Shining Wizards Network, to this day I'll, I'll go to bat for it and say it's one of the most brilliant things you've ever seen where you see this guy just morph into complete, like, insanity because he was given just one dud gimmick after another. And, you know, the wrestlers would make fun of him. And, you know, growing up, everybody made fun of him, which, you know, I can relate to. If you're a big wrestling fan and you come to school wearing a WrestleMania 3 t-shirt, and, <laughs> you know, the kids in my school weren't very nice to me. I grew up in an all-Italian town. So it was like, you know, they kind of, they found it kind of weird that I'd be wearing pro wrestling t-shirts to school. It wasn't exactly the coolest thing to do at the time. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, now I got like, now I only have like four weeks left and I'm getting everybody I ever went to high school or grade school with that wants to hang out and, <laughs> and kind of pick my brain. And, hey, what's it like living overseas? And, it's and like it's the just tables like, have turned. Yeah, and it's just like, you're not going to make amends. Now, you're not. It's just I, I kind of went my own direction. I wanted it more than, I feel like almost more than anybody on this planet. It's just that I kind of sort of got lucky because not, I mean, a day doesn't go by, not a week or a month, where I'm over there where someone messages me and, and goes, hey, man, how do I get a foot in the door? How do I, how do, I do any of that Japanese stuff? And I'm just like, it is so different from... 1994 how i got a foot in there to 2018 where it's just it's it's just so different it is so different i was gonna say it's like light years different 
Yeah, it's to the point where a guy goes from wrestling a blow up doll and wrestling, you know, uh, an eight year old little girl to being the top wrestler in the entire country w- within a ten year span of time. He goes from wrestling with a joke fed, and that same joke fed is now the fodder system. DDT is the you know little sister of New Japan Wrestling, which is crazy to think about. And it is, but you know what else too? I mean, something had to give, something had to change. I mean, New Japan, when you look at New Japan now, and you look at what it was like 10 years ago, it doesn't even look like the same promotion. That's it's true. Under, yeah, it's underwent different owners, and at one point they had a video game that <laughs> that was the owner, you know, a video gaming uh, 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 company or corporation that had owned them to, you know, and then in the days of Inoki and some of the weird stuff that he would book. And then it, you know, delved into the whole shoot fighting atmosphere, like back in 02 and 03. You know, I mean, even Onita the- wrestled there uh, for one of their big shows back in the early 2000s. Yeah, which to me was fantastic. That was it's- a weird <laughs> thing to see. Tell me the cool- the coolest heel I've ever seen in my entire life, the best heel I've ever seen. Was when he's coming out to wrestle Chono. Yeah. Yeah, and you just see the fans pelting him with garbage and Onita just smiling, smoking a cigarette. Going, like he doesn't even give yeah. a shit. Yeah, he's like, so what? I'm a garbage wrestler. You know what I'm going to do? And he had this attitude on his face. You could read his face. He was saying, I'm taking all this money that I'm getting from all you assholes showing up, and I'm going to run for the Japanese diet, and I'm going to win. You know, the Japanese diet is the equivalent of the United States Senate. Can you imagine Chris Christie doing something that outrageous? Just, <laughs> there's Onita with a big smile on his face, dragging a, dragging a steel chair out there like, go ahead, hit me with garbage. Get it out of your system. <laughs> oh, I'm garbage. Yeah, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to lay down for this idiot. Thanks for the money. <laughs> yeah, that, that's great. All right, to uh, start wrapping things up, what can the fans expect from you for the rest of this year and the start of 2019? Well, as of now, um, one uh, September 24th, I fly out to Oregon, uh, Washington. WUW is the name of the promotion. Uh, Ron Von Hess runs it. He has students. Um I'm also doing a couple seminars out there just to try to help wherever I can with young guys breaking in. And um, it's like from there, I think I explained this before, I go all the way back to, because the Japanese had bought my ticket for Nork International. Uh, right out right out the gate, uh, October 8th, it's me and Takase on top where I challenge for the uh, WWS World Heavyweight title against him. And... It's like, of course, Halloween's the biggest night of the year, the biggest gimmick night of the year for me, too. And then eventually they're like, are you going to stick around for the 18-year anniversary show for WWS? Uh, What would it take for you to stay here? And I'm like, just filling up all those dates. So right into 2019, I'm staying straight through in Japan. So I have a a full four or five months solid that I'm doing over there. And that covers about everything. Everything from the Eagle promotion to Battle Aid to 666, some of the DDT shows. Uh, there's just so many independents over there that there are, you know, work is available. You'd have to be insane to turn down. Uh, see, I was going to say, I, I don't think a lot of people realize that there's so many companies over there. Yeah, I mean, there's, um, I brought up Ron Von Hess. He does a lot of work for like, um, Secret Underground, Style E. Um, there's a whole plethora of like at least four or five different companies that run out of that same building. And instead of ring ropes, they have like a chain put up. So everything looks like a complete shoot. Um, there's Secret Base. You know, there's so many. There's just a whole plethora of independents out there. And, That's you know, a cool to little me, twist. Oh, to me, those are so fun, man. Like, um, I remember Owate came to me and he goes, uh, you know, because Pogo would always have him on his WWS undercards. And, you know, I, I don't want to say who over there, but it was one of the veterans gave the guy like a real beating. And, you know, he's only a 21, 22-year-old kid. 
I went against them last year in a singles match, and we're doing inside cradles, kick out, sunset flips, arm drags, everything. And, you know, he was just kind of blown away. With, you know, I'd go to pick him up for a slam and drop him behind me and be like, let's see what he does. You know what I mean? Like, let's just see if he has the intuition to grab a hold or – and I turned right around, he gave me a Rana. And I was like, this guy gets it. This kid is fucking talent. This guy is great. And I was like – I remember, too, not to get cocky, but a lot of the guys were like, God damn, you had the best match on the card with that kid. And I was like, no, because I'm, I'm bad with compliments. I'm very humble. And I told him, I was like, you know, he goes, if, if you're going to do that kind of thing, he goes, the guys in Eagle are going to, you know, they're going to love this. And he was like, you will want to now? I go, yeah, everybody deserves a chance. Everybody deserves a, like when I was alive on Memphis TV, I was wrestling Tracy Smothers. And he would go to throw me off the ropes and go, sunset flipping, man. Everybody deserves that. At least a chance to shine. Oh, yeah. We went into uh, Matt Tremont's very first match in Japan. It's like a six man, and they they go, "You guys got like, ah, you guys got like seven or eight minutes out there, just squash him." I remember looking at DJ going, "I ain't squashing nobody," because then you haven't beaten anybody. Like, why would you squash these guys? They're not that bad. I was like the the the. <laughs> I was like, that one guy over there with the mask on, you know, is you can't call him by name because you don't know if DJ and them know this guy. I was like, guy with the white mask over there. I've had singles matches with him. He's great. I'm like, you can't just squash these guys, man. Even if you're getting put in the main event. It's like, you beat him in a dominant fashion, but come on, man. To not even give these guys a comeback or nothing. I was going to say, at least let them get their shit in. Yeah. I mean, I, I've watched this guy do like, a hip toss into a drop kick that looked awesome. I'm like, at least let him do that, you know? And then um, I went on record to say that, like, if anybody ever doubts the talent of Matt Tremont, I saw it with my own two eyes. The last three minutes of him going back and forth into that finish were, like, inside cradle, roll up, some of the most incredible wrestling anybody's ever seen. So, so much for, you know, deathmatch guys and the genre and the whole... Yeah, but they can't wrestle. No, I saw it with my own two eyes. I couldn't agree more. Now, if people want to get a hold of you, Tony, how can they contact you on social media? Well, I mean, Facebook is me, is mine, Tony Myers. Um, you know, I, I tend to get right back with people's messages and everything. I, I hate to, like, ignore anybody. You know, I just don't feel it's the right. You know, I eventually get back with people. But uh, you won't find much in a whole lot of, like, Chainsaw Tony on there. Uh, the Instagram account is solely developed for the entire Leatherface Chainsaw Tony thing. Everything out of there is me putting up pictures of the gimmick and everything else and a lot of the matches and stuff I've been through with it. So um, I hardly, if ever, rarely use Twitter. I just don't see the point in it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but there's some gems out there, you know. I try to keep it interesting. I, I got to agree with you. I, I personally only use it for this show because I think it's a cesspool. <laughs> yeah, it's like um, I'll keep up with several guys through Twitter just because that's the easiest way to get a hold of them. Um, it, it's like, uh, yeah, that because, I mean, overall, it just seems like Twitter is kind of like in a downward spiral. Like no one's really paying attention to it. Well, and it's just people want to be, like, really negative on there. It's the worst. Oh, yeah. I mean, I have read more criticism. You wouldn't believe the stuff that surfaces, you know. People, hey, hey, man, you're not really Leatherface. It's like, yeah, you're right, you know. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gee, I didn't know. <laughs> well, you sure showed me. You know, it's like, what am I going to do with my life now? <laughs> Yeah, my life is over. I got some <laughs> jack bag with a friggin' egg for a profile picture ripping into me. Whoopity doo. Yeah, I, I hear you, man. That's, like that's going to derail me in any kind of way from continuing to do what I do. It's not. <laughs> yeah, but I wanted to personally thank you for taking the time to come on and have a chat with me. Yeah, I thank you for the platform, man. Um, it, it's, you know, you get people. That'll say something about the plethora of podcasts out there. I think it's a great way to get things off your chest because it's not like I can go into, like, you know, I have a regular job in the States catering. 
it's not like I'm catering some, you know, corporate food event and that I could tell them about anything that I've been through recently or about what I'm about to do or how I'm leaving or even uh, what would it be like if I went up to any of those people at my job, uh, any of the cooks or chefs and started telling them about the, uh, uh, tell them about the time that, uh, <laughs> that don't need a peat on the side of the road. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, I don't or, think or, that would go over very well. Yeah, they would. They wouldn't know where to turn or what to do. They'd be like, "Yeah, yeah, that seems great, man." Like, yeah, but with you, you know, you can relate. You can understand, especially the stories that you told me about Onita. Like that. That's just him. You know, that's just the way he is. Absolutely. But uh, with that note, we're gonna get out of here for tonight. So don't forget to like, comment subscribe share give us a thumbs up all that stuff and we'll see you back next time have a good night everybody